modernize and rebuild our nuclear arsenal, hopefully never having to use it, but making it so strong and so powerful. The United States plans to modernize its nuclear triad capabilities on land, air and sea by revamping its nuclear arsenal and developing new low-yield atomic bombs. The lower-yield option, with less powerful explosive capacities for ballistic and cruise missiles launched from submarines, would enhance the capability of the U.S. arsenal. The Pentagon also claims that China and Russia are both expanding their nuclear forces and are challenging the free and open international order. The review adds that nuclear weapons could be used to respond to extreme circumstances, including non-nuclear attacks. The challenging and dynamic security environment requires steady action to strengthen deterrence. This NPR responds to today's security needs with a tailored nuclear deterrence strategy and flexible capabilities for effective deterrence. We call on all states possessing nuclear weapons to declare or to maintain a moratorium on nuclear testing. Going forward, we are also eager to increase transparency and predictability to avoid miscalculation among nuclear weapon states and other possessor states. China firmly opposed the Pentagon's nuclear posture review. The Chinese foreign ministry said the U.S. is looking for an excuse to expand its nuclear stockpile by distorting China's policy of no first use of nuclear weapons at any time and under any circumstances. We hope the United States will abandon its zero-sum Cold War mentality and antagonism in dealing with relations between big powers. The U.S. should follow the global trend of peace and development and effectively take up its responsibility to reduce its nuclear arsenal and reduce the role of nuclear weapons for national security, taking concrete actions to safeguard international peace and stability. The Russian Foreign Ministry also expressed disappointment with the anti-Russia content of the defense paper. The ministry said it regretted the U.S. posture with accusations against Russia of lowering the nuclear threshold and conducting some aggressive behavior. With the defense report slammed by both China and Russia, could Trump's nuclear posture review indeed spark a nuclear arms race? So, a new nuclear arms race? Let's turn to our panelists to answer that question. In Beijing studio, we have Zhao Tong, who's a fellow in the Carnegie Nuclear Policy Program based at Carnegie Tsinghua Center for Global Policy. Welcome, sir, to our program. Joining us in Washington, D.C., Michael O'Hallen, a senior fellow from the Center for 21st Century Security and Intelligence and also director of research for foreign policy at the Brookings Institution. Welcome as well. Over in Boston, we have Sun Young Lee, a Kim Ku Korea Foundation professor of Korean studies at Fletcher School at Tufts University. Welcome, Professor. In Moscow, last but not least, the Pavel Falkenhauer, a Russian defense analyst. The gentleman, I want to welcome all of you. Let's start with you, Mr. O'Hanlon. What exactly does the NPR suggest when it comes to these three points, technical, operational, as well as policy? Briefly, help us to understand this. Thank you. Nice to be with you. First of all, I want to commend China. I think China has continued to show a lot of restraint in its nuclear weapons policy. However, I think the best way to understand this nuclear posture review by the Trump administration is a response to recent Russian behavior. Russia is believed to be in violation of the INF Treaty. It's been talking about threatening nuclear weapons use in limited war scenarios. It's been buzzing NATO aircraft. I understand the origins of this Russian behavior are complicated, and I've tried to show some understanding of that All and right. propose a new approach to security in Europe. But one last quick point. Uh, this, this document is primarily a response to perceived Russian aggressiveness, and I hope that some of its steps are temporary, uh, but I do not think that they are fundamentally directed at China. I think they are primarily a response to Russia's behavior All right. in recent years. Mr. O'Hallan, may I continue to ask the same question? So what does this NPR mean for the U.S. side when it comes to technical, operational, as well as policy when it comes to these nuclear weapons and nuclear weapon piles? Well, I think your correspondent had it correct. 
that fundamentally we are trying to replace the nuclear triad, the three main elements of our nuclear force. That was an Obama administration policy already, and that was largely because the weapons are getting old. But on top of that, there is now the discussion of these two new, smaller types of nuclear weapons that are designed to respond to Russia's doctrine of escalate to de-escalate. In other words, trying to have the capability to deny Russia any ability to use small numbers of nuclear weapons and feel like it could get away with that without any kind of American or NATO response. So those are the ideas. But there will be no nuclear testing to create these new warheads. They will actually be modified versions of existing warheads, as I understand it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Let's go to Mr. Felgenhauer, because Russia's name has been repeatedly mentioned by Mr. O'Hanlon from the U.S. And Mr. Felgenhauer, I'm sure you want to respond to that, both about whether it is targeting Russia, whether Russia has the intention to challenge the United States, and your comments on the U.S. side when it comes to technical operational as well as policy, according to NPR. Um, well, Russia has been modernizing its nuclear arsenal and its nuclear triad, introducing new ballistic missiles, a sea launched um, new cruise, long, very long range cruise missiles to make its uh, bomber, strategic bomber force again operational, new mobile and silo based uh, uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles, while the United States was not. Uh, satisfied with what was developed and deployed in, during the Cold War. Mm. Now the America is moving into a modernization part, but that will take a lot of time, this modernization. We're talking about somewhere in the 30s, maybe, uh, when these new, uh, or maybe even 40s, when new submarines, new uh, bombers appear. What's right now actually more urgent from the United States point of view is the disparency in so-called tactical weapons. Mm. And that's maybe aimed not so much at Russia as at the Obama administration, which unilaterally kind of uh, dismantled the American tactical nuclear capability almost to zero. It's not zero, but it. it's not really effective anymore. And so now the Pentagon wants to quickly revamp the tactical capability because, of course, uh, that's not covered by any treaty. Mm -hmm. and Russia has kept the tactical capability and also developed new tactical uh, long-range crews and ballistic missiles. All right, let's go to Mr. Zhao here in China. What exactly, if you could use one minute or even less to help us understand the situations of nuclear weapon capabilities, United States, Russia, and China. I know it's a big topic, but sir, please help us understand this because people from outside, it's very hard to understand these technical issues. I think at this moment, U.S. and Russia are the you know, primary nuclear powers in the world. Their nuclear weapons stockpile in total constitute about 90 percent of the entire nuclear weapons stockpile in the world. Mm. And both countries, in terms of the technology of the nuclear weapons, are very advanced and more advanced than most other nuclear weapon states. They also have tactical nuclear weapons uh, that can be delivered by uh, fighter and bombers, etc. And countries like China, uh, UK, and France don't necessarily have those technical nuclear weapons. So they're Got still it. very much ahead of most other countries. Professor Lee, I know you're not a nuclear weapon expert, but please help us understand what would all of this mean? Because when the P NPR talking about so many areas, strategic triad, when it comes to ICBM, SLBMs, replacement of a delivery system, the central command system, recapitalization of the infrastructure. There's also low yield, long-term yield, all of these options. Budget-wise, what does it mean for the United States? Will there be consensus on the so-called plan? You're right, Ms. Tian. I'm no nuclear expert, and all I can do is to offer the perspective of a small peninsula state, mm. South Korea. Now, it sounds a bit contradictory or counterintuitive, but the more powerful a major nuclear weapons possessing state grows, the more fearful its small dependent allies may become because the U.S. may come across as reckless, perhaps even, more willing to use these so-called low-yield devices 
that is pulling mm. down the number of casualties, death inflicted from millions to tens of thousands, but that's not reassuring. Mm. Now, back in the 50s, when the Soviet Union felt that China was too adventurous, especially in the wake of the bombing of the offshore islands in August 1958, Khrushchev rescinded on the bilateral technical nuclear technical accord of 1957, basically telling the Chinese, we changed our mind, we're not going to help you with providing mm. a blueprint for the bomb or any technical data. And that drove China to develop on its own, its own nuclear capability. Got it. My point is, yes, the U.S. is showing its intention more than its capability, but it may actually backfire because you don't want to come across as too adventurous. All right. Just because Mr. Trump wants to spend more on nukes, his administration, as mentioned earlier, may not necessarily all on the same page. In July, the president was shown this chart that maps the functions, the fluctuations rather, in the U.S. nuclear arsenals over the past 70 years. The president reportedly demanded boosting the U.S. active stockpile to 1960s level, a tenfold increase. Secretary of State Tillerson was said to have called Trump a moron in response. Of course, he later said he didn't at all, and now he's pretty much following all the rhetoric in the president's steps. Having said that, though, Mr. O'Hanlon, are we going back to the Cold War time? Is it really the time that the Russia, even though, as you mentioned many times earlier, and the United States are likely in another nuclear arsenal race? And as we all understand, you know, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the collapse of the former Soviet Union was partly due to a arms race. Will Russia be just like what it was? And will the United States run the same way? Well, I'm certainly very nervous about U.S.-Russian relations right now, although I appreciate very much my colleague in Moscow on this show. I thought his analysis was excellent and very fair, and I think that the United States and Russia should be able to get back to a good relationship. But right now, we do not have a good relationship, and we're even seeing manifestations of the tension and rivalry in this domain of nuclear mm -hmm. force modernization, as he just pointed out. So, um, uh, you know, the good news is at least we are at much lower levels of nuclear forces than during the Cold War, and we're going to stay at much lower levels. The bad news is we still have much larger nuclear forces than I think any realistic assessment of need would lead you to believe we really should be possessing. We're both spending more money on our nuclear force modernization than I think we should. Right. And there are tensions in terms of how the forces operate near each other. So yes, it's, it, it's a little bit of a nerve-wracking time. But what about your other colleague, uh, Professor Lee's argument from the South Korea perspective that the more arms race, even so-called low yield, uh, is going on, the more nervous the allies are, the less feel protected they are. So what exactly is the purpose of the United States developing its nuclear arms program, not only to protect itself, I would assume, as the Pentagon would argue, but also to uh, so-called protect its allies, and yet the other side just don't feel that way. Well, I don't think that the United States is going to become reckless in the use of nuclear weapons, and I think it's important not to overestimate how much this nuclear posture review is changing uh, that particular view of the United States. But I understand my South Korean friends' uh, concerns because we are obviously in a very tense time on the Korean Peninsula for reasons that go way beyond mm. this particular nuclear posture review. And in that context, any kind of rhetoric that seems to be a little bit more assertive could be a little bit worrisome, especially if American diplomacy is not careful on the North Korea question. So right. I'm less concerned about the nuclear posture review per se. I'm more worried about our overall strategy towards handling North Korea right now, where I think we need a somewhat more realistic strategy okay. for an interim deal on freezing the North Korean arsenal than, than right now President Trump seems to favor. Well, at this point, Mr. Zhao, the question is, these things are going at the same time. Okay, the nuclear posture review is not published out of vacuum. It is published at the time all of these crises are happening, including the Korean Peninsula crisis. So, when Mr. O'Hanlon said that he's not that concerned about the report itself per se, uh, yes, 
Maybe not, but this is exactly happening at the same time. Yes, indeed. I think um, it's unfortunate that the rollout of the report uh, took place at such a uh, complex uh, you know, time. Um, it's a Congress mandated process, so mm -hmm. uh, every new administration uh, conducts its new, new care path to review. So uh, we have been expecting it coming out for some time. So I don't think it is timed to coincident, uh, co uh, coincide with the Korean Peninsula crisis, for example. But the message was indeed worrisome, mm. uh, and against the background of rising tensions, and also given that the U.S. government is now focusing more on major power competitions, peer near peer rivals. Mm. Uh, strategic competition with Russia and China. Some of the messages in this report, such as um, its emphasis on small yield technical weapons, will certainly encourage these countries to follow suit. Mm -hmm. And also, this report abandons some of the key messages of the Trump, uh, of the Obama era nuclear past like review. What? In the Obama administration, the nuclear posture review really emphasized maintaining strategic stability, which is a technical term mm -hmm. between nuclear powers, which means they honor the existence of mutually assured destruction. And mm -hmm. U.S. won't deliberately try to destroy another country's nuclear second strike capability. But in this nuclear posture review report, uh, there is no mentioning of maintaining bilateral strategic stability relations with right. either Russia or China. Mm -hmm. I think that will further make these countries nervous and make it more likely that these countries will try to build up their own nuclear weapons. Mm. Having said that though, Mr. Zhao, I need to follow up a bit by that because China is clearly named as a potential nuclear adversary to the United States in that PR, uh, NPR rather. Uh, so China, of course, strongly against that from the foreign ministry said very clearly the Ministry of Defense as well. But when you are being named clearly already in an official document, what does it mean for China? And what does it mean for, let's just say, U.S.-China coordination, if there is any, on the issue of Korean Peninsula, as the two are, I think, should be busy mainly on this issue? Well, I think it's okay for the U.S. to name China in this important report. This shows China's growing international status and importance. The problem is the Obama administration named China in a positive way. Uh, plan, uh, you know, promising to maintain strategic mm. stability with China, while this report defines China as a rival. Another problem is um, this report, it mis misunderstands the nature of U.S.-China nuclear relationship. Which is? It says the threat from China is China might use nuclear weapons pre preemptively in a limited manner in a conventional war. And therefore, the U.S. needs to focus on developing... Is that what China is having in mind? That's definitely not. And China has the policy of never being the first to use nuclear weapons under any conditions. Mm. So that misplaced concern about China, I think, is misleading American decision makers. All right, let me go to you, Professor Lee, as well. You are a very good history reader, as I can tell through many interviews earlier with you, sir. Um, have we seen any similar moments in history and will this uh, nuclear posture review help at all about what is likely to be temporary at least a break from the tension on the Korean Peninsula given the Winter Olympic Games is coming? Well, when you're talking about nuclear parity on both sides, the U.S. and Russia, in the thousands, almost 7,000 bombs held by each side. Mm. It's mind-numbing to most laymen like me. Why is this necessary? Is the posturing excessive? Not only would it make potentially allies nervous, uh, this kind of posturing may also provide an opportunity and excuse for a country like North Korea to conduct another nuclear test, to do another provocation that it would have done anyway, and to blame the United States for its hostile policy, especially in the wake of the opening of the Olympic Games uh, this week and the fuzzy, the very warm dynamics that atmospherics we see between the two Korean states. So mm. I think 
in terms of real action, you know, North, uh, the United States has not conducted a nuclear test in many years. In 1958, uh, there were dozens of nuclear tests between 58 and 62. The former Soviet Union and the United States conducted more than 20 nuclear tests, massive tests, some mm -hmm. of them in the Earth's atmosphere. So I see this more as posturing, sending out messages, but the message may be used against you. All right. Let me go to you once again, Mr. O'Hannon, because the United States recently has certainly made clear its focus of attention overseas is not going to be about the terrorism anymore. It is more about the uh, United States' adversary to some of the key countries, Russia, for example, China possibly also included, as it has been included in the State of the Union, and nuclear past review. So what does it mean if there is any spread of nuclear weapon, even small scale? That probably is the most dangerous thing that you could imagine besides the so-called nation state. Uh, Mr. O'Hanlon, please. Well, again, I think the report may have made a mistake to imply that Russia and China are similar kinds of problems for the United States. American strategists realize that China's power is impressive and growing, and therefore, uh, to the extent we have issues that divide us, this requires a certain amount of vigilance by the United States. But I personally believe that China's behavior is much more restrained than Russia's behavior. Right. And certainly China's nuclear force is much smaller and shows more restraint than Russia's. So I believe the United States should have made a clearer distinction in how we think about Russia and China in the national security strategy, the national defense strategy, and also the nuclear posture review. And I admire China's restraint on nuclear matters. I think it's done a good job of that. Over the decades, I would like to see Russia and the United States emulate China a bit more in the future. But, but sir, just one sentence, if you can. What if there is spread of terrorism and taking hold of uh, the nuclear weapons by the terrorists? That's going to be one of the horrific things in the world. Very briefly, sir, we're running out of time. If that's to me, I agree with yes. you, but it's almost a separate question from how you modernize your nuclear forces. All right. It's, it's a separate dimension of policy. Uh, it's related, but it's different. All right. Uh, Mr. Falkenhauer, before we go, 30 seconds for you as well to respond, just to be fair. Okay, uh, we, I mean, right, what, right now, nothing really serious is going to happen because of this review. All right. Uh, there's going to be a small, uh, uh, an action to uh, down, uh, to load a small number of American Trident missiles with low yield weapons, uh, sort of tra changing them from strategic weapons to s s somehow tactical, All because right. that can be done swiftly and cheaply. All but right. there's a second very important thing in that, uh, in that posture. That's that America wants to develop uh, and deploy a All new right. sea-based uh, long-range uh, cruise missile. And that can be very, very destabilizing and dangerous. Have our because, uh, the American Sun Young Lee and Michael Helen, as well okay. as Zhao Tong. I'm really running out of time. So sorry. We can continue our discussion next time. Thank you so much, sir, for being with us. All of you, gentlemen. Really appreciate